so this is Larry Legend, um, a really big part of the New York City scene. And yeah, so how old were you when you started playing music? Um, at probably six, something like that. What did you start on? Piano. Okay. Our, uh, we, we used to go to like a group piano class, kind of like Suzuki, but for piano. And it was, the, the brand was Yamaha. Okay. Yeah. So you started on classical music? Yeah, I think so. It, I mean, the first few songs were like uh, nursery rhymes, mm -hmm. and then, yeah, and then I guess it worked in the classical music. Uh, but we didn't like to go. Look, uh, my my sister, who's uh, two and a half years older, we used to go together with my mom and dad every every weekend. Mm -hmm. It was the worst. Yeah, sounds like a lot. Of fun. <laughs> um, so then, how did you get into bluegrass? Um. It all happened uh, maybe five or six years ago. Um, I had uh, um, gotten really into music in high school, mm -hmm. and then I got into jazz, and then I ended up going two years uh, to a non-music school, and then switching to a music major while I was there. Then I went to Berkeley and, and uh, was just like all all jazz all the time, jazz yeah. piano, and uh, and then I hurt my wrist when I was there, but Kind of trying to play and practice too much so i stopped okay and then through my 20s i was trying to do stuff in music but not as someone who was playing music like i worked for a record label and worked as a recording engineer and uh wanted to be like a producer kind of person um and then uh after several years of that i was looking for other things to do for for work because it was getting to be not that fun to try to couple together a living doing that stuff. Yeah. And then, um, so I had, I had stopped playing music and then I moved back to New York and I just started taking guitar lessons, just sort of more the way a normal person takes guitar lessons for like a very mild hobby. Yeah. And, uh, and I was doing that for a couple years and I kind of just slowly started doing it more. And then, um, so I guess this is a long way to say that I started taking guitar lessons okay. and I've been doing it for like a, a year or two. And then I went with a friend to Rock, Rockwood to see this person who I never heard of called Michael Daves. Okay. And um, he was playing that, that um, I don't... It's Tuesday night set. Yeah, the Tuesday night set at 10. But also back then he often played this, this smaller guitar made of plywood. That's, I think it's like a True Tone brand. Okay. Have you seen... I don't know if... He, he doesn't do it that much anymore, but have you seen videos where he's playing that? Probably. Yeah. Um, so it's very, like, uh, buzzy and droney the way he plays it. Yeah. And he kind of tunes okay. it way Nothing down, that. but it, it yeah. makes a lot of, like, buzzy noise. That. Yeah. And um, so it sounded very kind of, like, droney, and it, it, the way he was singing to, I wasn't used to someone even singing regular bluegrass. Yeah. And then he was doing it a little more screamy, yeah. even. And sure. I was just like, this is amazing. But then, um, so I just like looked him up when I got home mm -hmm. and uh, signed up for his email list. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know, probably several weeks later, I got an email that said that he was teaching classes about like intro to bluegrass guitar, something yeah. like that. And so I just decided to take that class to augment my, my guitar lessons I was taking. Okay. And then, because I knew he was some kind of... He was just like an awesome musical person. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I just kind of wanted to, if he was going to teach classes, I wanted to see what they were all about. Mm -hmm. And it was so amazing because I'd never sat in front of someone playing an acoustic guitar like that where like so much yeah. sound comes out of the instrument. And um, I don't know, I guess maybe I've learned sort of the different parts of playing that go into it somewhat, but it was just so cool to be there in front of him in this little class. And yeah. um, so... That year, he taught like five different classes. Yeah, he does every year. Yeah, and I, I, after the first week of the first one, I just signed up for all, all his classes. Them. I just sent him like a PayPal for the entire the entire year of classes. That's great. And uh, and uh, uh, that just each with each one, I kind of got more and more hooked on bluegrass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you play the bass now. How did that come about? Well. Uh, from the exposure through those classes, I started going to jams, mm -hmm. which seemed super fun too, because I always liked playing with other people when I used to play jazz. Mm -hmm. That was the most fun part. And so I was like, great, this is a great, you know, it's, it's also like when you're starting out, you're, uh, and 
I mean, I'm, I'm still not great at guitar, but when you're starting out, you feel very uh, hesitant about like make, you don't know how you would ever like play with other people in a band or yeah. stuff like that. And so, um, so jams are so good for that. So I started going to jams and, uh, I noticed that there was no bass and there were always like five or six guitar players mm -hmm. and a lot of times you can't even hear your own guitar yeah so then I was like oh oh so then I, I hadn't really I, that's all I would noticed up to that point then I went to Gray Fox that year yes. so this all happened like in this one year and uh, which Gray Fox which year I don't know I'd have to check my my chronology okay. like the calendar but uh, it was probably five or six years ago okay and uh, at Gray Fox, because it's like everybody's a bluegrass person, mm -hmm. you see so many more uh, just like banjos and fiddles and yeah. upright basses than you just see in normal life, even at a, a jam. Yeah. Um, and so once I just saw all those people with upright basses, I was just it, like, it put the thought in my mind like, oh, I could just get an upright bass. That's probably not that hard. Yeah. And then, uh, and then when I got back, I just went to this bass store in New York called David Gage. Okay. And they had a, a rent to buy program where you can rent a base for three months. And then if you like the experience, then you can use what you paid renting a base. And buy it? Toward, no, you, well, towards that base or a different base, probably. Okay. Um, so I did that. Did Although, you stick with this base? No, they, I was actually renting a, a, a modern, uh, like Shen type base. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I didn't actually, this one was a, a K, an older K that was on consignment. Okay. And so I, um, I bought this because it was, they, they didn't actually have, uh, it was the cheapest one they had. Okay. But they didn't, they didn't have the, the ones that, that was equivalent to the one that I was renting that was even, actually even cheaper. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able, anyway, because it was on consignment, I didn't get to use the uh, rental credit towards it, but uh -huh. it still worked out great and I love this base. And, uh, it's a cool base. Yeah, it's cool. It's been, it's been really uh, fun to play. Yeah. Um, so what would you say is the initial draw you had to bluegrass? Um, it's, uh, it's cool that it's acoustic instruments, so there's kind of like a, no uh, extra overhead of like a, a bunch of gear and amps and pedals and stuff that's, uh, there's a little bit like a kind of like, there's like no BS to it. Similar when you just play an acoustic piano. Uh, there's a simplicity to that mm -hmm. and then the rest is kind of up to you that was cool and it was fun that uh, there was a lot of opportunity to play with other people yeah um, and uh, and the the kind of groovy fun part about it where just people are kind of you know that like two field thing it's just immediately groovy even in the hands of the beginners at jams it still mm -hmm. has like a, a fun groove to it which is yeah. just fun and then um, I, uh, the blues, bluesy aspect of mm -hmm. it too is I always like that in music, like the, the flat thirds with the major thirds and the flat yeah. sevens and all that. And then the other thing is I was friends with a, a group of um, a few Michael, other Michael Dave students at the time. Okay. And we used to talk about, um, we were in a way we were just like in, this, in the school of Michael Dave's. <laughs> And if he played some other style of music, if it was polka or punk rock or whatever, we would just be playing that kind of music because yeah. we were almost just so inspired by him that um, we were just doing doing sort of what he does. So. Yeah. So you've been in the scene for about five years. Yeah, maybe a little more. Okay. The the years kind of start stacking up, but maybe six ish years, something like that. Yeah. Have yeah, you seen the new. scene in New York City evolve in that time, like the bluegrass? Scene? Seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I definitely notice is there's different, um, just kind of like uh, you're in, in school right now, and then so next year you're going to be what? A eleventh song, grade. Eleventh grade. Yeah. So already when those ninth graders come in, mm -hmm. they look like a completely different generation to me to you, and because now you're in eleventh grade, you recognize that they're like you know like eager eyed and like like but also like kind of new to the school they don't know where anything is and everything yeah. and so it just being around for a few years you kind of notice that when like some like oh who are all these new people who are coming to the jam that i've been going to now for like a year or two but you, you get so like you feel like it's your jam then all these yeah. new people come and then and then eventually you become 
you know, friends and familiar with those people. Mm -hmm. And then, it, so it almost makes like these, these, um, like little micro generations. So, so just being around for, you know, six years or whatever, uh, I've seen like a couple waves of that. So the people yeah. change, but the, the, it's almost like they take the role of somebody else behind them. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so it's fun to see that. And, um, as far as the, uh, the nature of the scene, uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't think I'll have the perspective on that until more time goes by, but it's been fun to hear in New York about how there was like a, a scene before and there was something called the uh, Alphabet City Opry and, uh, uh, like a whole, you know, I've never heard of that. Oh yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, so if you talk to some of the people who have been playing bluegrass in New York for like 20 years, they talk about that. And, uh, there was this guy, Greg Gehring. And then, and then there was sort of, as far as I understand it, right when I was getting into it, Michael was uh, still playing some with Chris Steely, or it just finished yeah, that sort of that been period. That time. And I think that was after, that was sort of like another stage of it. Mm -hmm. And then Mona's has been, been going strong, uh, led by Rick years. for yeah. So I think that that the culture of that jam has stayed similar, but it's sort of has some of that generational aspect to it too, just even in those six years. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't know if it's getting more popular or if I just know more about yeah. this jam and that jam, but it seems like it's growing. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a jam every night in the city. <laughs> Is there? For the most part. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, or there's always something happening. Yeah. Okay, you're kind of a part of this, but there are a lot of people in, like, their 20s and 30s playing, um, when traditionally bluegrass is, like, for older folks, most most of the time, like, in, at least in other states and things, you'll find jams with, like, a bunch of really old folks. And, like, you find that here, too. But mm -hmm. there seems to be, like, a huge community of, like, people in their 20s and 30s playing. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I, I'm not sure why. I could guess. I definitely, in my mind, I pictured that, that there there is sort of, like, a couple humps of, of age distribution. There's there's those people in their 20s and 30s, and then there's sort of like nobody as much in their 30s, 40s, maybe. Yeah. And then when 50s and 60s, it sort of comes back up when people are like getting really into banjo in their retirement or whatever. So, you know, probably a lot of it just has to do with the people who have discretionary time to go to jams and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, people who are, you know, either retired or getting towards the mature end or part of their career mm -hmm. have a little more time. And then, you know, people in their 20s and 30s are, like, new to New York and yeah. have time. And then, you know, when they're in their 30s and 40s, maybe they're, like, focused more on family stuff and kids. And um, But I think there's also, like, a popularity aspect to it, too, where some of those older folks maybe were into it in the either the 60s and 70s or early 80s mm -hmm. when I think there was some amount of popularity to bluegrass. Yeah. Uh, and then... Um, there might have been a little bit of a wane of popularity, and then and then I, it seems now there's a uh, a huge uh, increase in just sort of like anything that sort of is nostalgic and American, mm -hmm. whether it's like reclaimed wood in like in like yuppie Brooklyn bars or uh, artisanal mayonnaise or and like I, I think bluegrass fits into that a little bit, like back to basics and you know we spend so much time on our phones and technology and stuff that it's super appealing to people, even younger people, so. Yeah. Do you have any standout experiences playing in the New York scene? Or in general? What do you mean by stand out? In what way stand out? Are you thinking? Um, like, I don't know, the coolest thing or the funnest thing that happened? I don't know. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I've done so many fun things. It's really a wonderful community, and um, it's crazy in New York that there's so many amazing musicians who are around. Mm -hmm. And um, partly be, um, just from playing bass, which has a, a relatively low barrier to entry compared to playing like bluegrass fiddle or yeah, um, get all the gigs. Yeah, well, yeah, so I've been able to play with just so many amazing people yeah. on a semi-regular basis, and so that continues to be just like uh, mind blowing to me and incredible. Yeah, and it's fun because you know the the more you play with good people, the the better you get. 
Yeah, and so um, it's helped just get me up to speed somewhat. Um, it's it's uh, always fun to play at the Michael Dave's Jam on the first Monday. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something I've been going to ever since that first year. Okay. And so just, I keep going back and uh, year by year I get a, li a little better at it. I definitely get yeah. more comfortable with the whole thing. And um, uh, I started going to the Mona's Jam a few years ago and sitting in on bass and that was super intense at first because it's yeah, definitely a, 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 just a higher level jam and you, you get a little less coddled uh, and people are calling a lot more uh, variety of tunes Yeah. and they're just, uh, things are faster, everything's happening faster. Yes. <laughs> and, but you know, the, the people, uh, Rick in particular, I, I think when they see uh, someone who's excited about the music and and also I think on bass too they're they're willing to give you a little extra help mm -hmm. um, just because if they if, you know if you gotta get the bass player on board anyway or the whole thing's not gonna work so yeah. anyway um, Rick and a couple other people were were generous about like if I didn't know some crazy tune they were calling then they they'd walk me through it real quick before yeah. we played it and so. That was very welcoming, but anyway, that that was a, that's been a really fun jam to go to. Although I don't go as much anymore, just because it's it's it goes so late. Yeah, <laughs> I love how like every Monday, like I'll see on Facebook or Instagram, like come playing at Mona's tonight, nine thirty to late. Yeah. Or something. You know. The Sunny's jam can be really fun. Um, yeah. Uh, and for a year, I played that every week as the house bass player. That was like a little gig I had uh -huh. when they when they started having a house bass player. And um, it, it could be grueling because it, it could be for anywhere from like four to seven hours straight of bass playing. Wow, but, seven hours. Yeah, because if it starts at nine and then uh, just to get to midnight is three hours. So it, the latest it would go would be 4 a.m. And a few wow. times I would stick around that long. But um, after I did that a few times, I, I realized I should probably just go home at one-ish. And then it's Are you gonna go tonight? better for the next day. I don't know. I have to see. But that's that's a fun part about the the Saturday night jam at Sunny's is, uh, you know, if you end up being out, a lot of people end up being like, oh, let's go somewhere else, let's go down to Sunny's, see what's yeah. going on there. So, yeah, so that's fun. I see pictures from that jam from um, I don't know, Bruce and Michael something. I don't know. Yeah. They post pictures every Saturday. Yeah. And uh, yeah. An another thing that was really uh like a peak. I mean, yeah. The, uh, I guess I could just keep listing stuff that was fun because it's all fun. But yeah, um, uh, along with a couple other people from the Michael Davis world, uh, Robert Kitchens and, and Kay Prasher, we, yeah. we made a band. This is also sort of towards those early days, and uh, we decided, okay, we're going to be a band. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, like, pretty much the next week, the, uh, Kay got an email that said, "Oh, we're we're opening this restaurant and." Uh, Kind of restaurant bar and we're looking for a bluegrass to play the opening and we're looking for a bluegrass trio because it's we're, we kind of have this like number three theme going yeah and then i guess so because they're called threes yeah and now it turned out to be threes brewing so um we played before they opened for kind of like a, a soft launch opening just for like friends and family and then they asked us to start playing every week and we did that for like a long time like yeah, you're still one or two that. years but we did it every week and oh, it was wow. with this same band the three of us wow. so the first time we had to learn three hours of tunes and mm -hmm. so we played every song that any of us knew to get through the three hours um, but we did a pretty good job and then we just kept doing it and we got better and better uh, as a group and that, that was really fun and then eventually we were able to just we, we, we instead of uh, distributing out the money from each game we just put it basically in our band bank account Okay. and then um, so we had thousands of dollars in there from wow. playing it every week. So we were able to finance our own record and our own tour just off the oh, wow. our, our like band budget. That's so cool. So it was pretty awesome. It was, so that was a, a huge opportunity. So now Sean Keeley plays with you guys in that. Uh, Sean Kiley often plays. Kiley. Yeah, um, he uh, lives in in Jersey City. Yeah. So um, he'll play sometimes. Well, really, uh, w the, how it is now is. Um, Kate and I usually play, and mm -hmm. then we grab uh, one or two other people, yeah. just whoever we can get, different amazing guitar players. And yeah, you've been getting some really good things yeah. the last couple of Yeah, weeks. yeah, it's been fun. Yeah. It's been fun. We were driving up to Delfest, and I'm like, you know, this is the one Sunday 
where he's got like the best band there is and we're not I can't go. <laughs> I think it was Ross Martin and Kenny Kosek playing with you. Guys. Oh yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I so I get to play with Kate it. a lot. Yeah. And then uh and Robert. Um mm -hmm. uh he's uh been working at Rockwood since he moved back to town. Mm -hmm. And so he's got his own night that's turned into like kind of an extravaganza music music variety show with all different people yeah. he knows. And um, so Kate and I have, have been playing with him now and then on that too. And um, he's got this other kind of country band happening. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So you were talking about this a lot before, but there's a really strong scene and community around bluegrass. Yeah. How do you think the community affects how the music progresses? Hmm. Or do you? I don't know. Explain more about that. That's an interesting question. Well... I mean, there's like a huge community around this kind of music. Yeah. And the music has obviously changed some in the past like 20 years that it's been around. Yeah. Here. Do you think that like the community, um, like the people around it have anything to do with how it changes or like why it's changing or like if it's getting better or worse or something? Hmm. I think for sure. Obviously, yeah, there's, yeah. but, um. Uh, I think it, it can come down to like, uh, things that sort of are just circumstance, but they end up having these effects like, um, um, like, uh, for example, um, that band I was just talking about mm -hmm. with Kate in it, Kate used to host a jam in Ditmas Park at a, at a place called Sycamore. Really? Yeah. And so... She did that once a month mm -hmm. or twice a month. I guess it was once a month. It was kind of opposite the Michael Dave's jam on, on third Mondays or something, I think. Okay. I could be just remembering this wrong, but okay. it was definitely a, it was a regular jam. And so people used to go to that. And then a little micro community developed around that jam. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of where that band came out of. Is, is It was just almost the people who went to the jam every week. Okay. And um, now I see that like a lot of people who go to the sunny, uh, yeah, the Saturday Night Sunny's jam, mm -hmm. there's like, there's some bands that have spun yeah. off of, of that little micro pop. So that kind of thing, I like, it's like, it, yeah, I don't know. It, it's almost like a, some kind of, uh, musical Petri dish. And then like things yeah. grow in around the little, the little jams or, or culture of the different things. And like, even, um, I, I noticed that since that uh, sad song happy hour jam mm -hmm. was at a reasonable time on a Friday and it, it was it's not a bar mm -hmm. then you were able to come off and yeah and so probably that gave you an, a reason to keep practicing fill tunes each yeah. week because then you knew had you knew you had some kind of context to play in so that yeah that might have those kind of things might be more encouraging where otherwise you might have just been like you know what I think I'm gonna do photography or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Definitely. kinda cool. And then, you know, whenever you go to a new school or if when you go off to college, like there may be some other entirely different context and mm -hmm. so that that might change your course and you know, you'll bring whatever it is that you love and, and your personality to like whatever context you end up being in at that point. That might not be bluegrass or it might be your you know yeah. what I'm saying. Okay. Here's the tough question. Uh oh. If you could describe bluegrass in one word or phrase, what would it be? I don't know. Do I really have to make up an answer? Yep. Uh, one. Oh, I can do a phrase, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think it's a. Uh, it's like a, to me there's, this is the phrase, it's okay. like a con, uh, like a, a hybrid or a confluence okay. of folk traditions and then dressed up a little bit for uh, like stage performance essentially. Okay. Cause I, I think what it came out of with, um, uh, you know, Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys mm -hmm. was, uh, he was taking, uh, obviously like the different pieces of f different folk 
music that he was exposed to, like, um, you know, whatever the gospel music and brother duets and uh, jazz and blues and um, Appalachian music, mm -hmm. rolled those different folk traditions together and kind of made like a mishmash, almost like today if you were going to do some kind of like, I don't know, jazz, drum and bass, indie rock, like dubstep hybrid. And yeah. then you just try to make like the ultimate crazy like yeah. mixed up music and then the other thing is some of those folk traditions were a little bit more I guess like things you do around the house mm -hmm. or uh, sitting around and there wasn't really like a stage in an audience and he brought a little bit more of like a performance uh, vibe to it yeah and then I think that that carries through now uh, just like in the way that the folkies when they start songs they just sort of strum into it yeah and uh everybody doesn't really come in once and people sort of like built you know drop in is once they figure out what key it's in yeah and um in bluegrass there's a little bit more of a premium on like let's start the tune like let's figure out a tempo a key and then we'll get someone to kick it off we'll make a nice intro and it'll like come in with a little bit of professional bang yeah and so, so some of that i think stems stems back to that and bill monroe also trying to uh, set his band apart from from what they called hillbilly music at the time. Yeah. So they were wearing suits instead of uh, dressing up as like some kind of hillbilly stereotype with a hat mm -hmm. and, and uh, what do you call it? Overalls, Overalls. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, okay. So you um, mentioned this earlier, but you run this great event called Sad Song Happy Hour. How did that start? Um, it started when uh, I think we had played a, a gig at threes mm -hmm. and I was walking back from that uh, okay. on Union Street and we walked by near tea house okay. and the person I now know is Fumio was outside and he's like oh hey you guys are musicians we're looking for musicians we we have this uh, like uh, coffee tea house thing here okay. and so my friend like that if someone says that to you on the street when you're walking by with your instrument cases and the bass and stuff that's not like a good pitch. That's that's sort yeah. of like, I don't think I really want to talk to you. But yeah. uh, so my my friends were already like halfway down the block at that point, and uh, I was just being sort of like uh, a little extra night, like too nice, which I often am mm -hmm. for better or for worse. And so I was just like kind of chatting with the guy, and I and I and he was like, yeah, come inside. We had like a really nice piano and everything. And then, so there's this door that just looks like... You never go into a stranger's place. <laughs> I know. And it just looks like an apartment, kind of. And he just opens the door. It but in, inside, it's this beautiful space. Yeah. And they had a really nice piano. And I think also in the back of my mind, I already was, like, thinking, like, wow, the ultimate thing would be is if I could get a weekly way to play and, and just be able to play um, every week. Yeah. Um, just because I already knew that was great from threes doing uh, bluegrass mm -hmm. and I was looking for a way to do it with like where I could sing a little more mm -hmm. and um, uh, play guitar and essentially try to do a very very light version of what Michael has been doing for like at this point 12 years or whatever yeah. at Rockwood every night and because he's so good at that and I would like to be better at doing that because there, there again it's like it's like no BS just like you an acoustic guitar mm -hmm. and you're singing and so there's a lot you have to do to make that awesome and so uh, I had played a few gigs like that in the preceding months but I was so nervous and also not great at it uh, so I just wanted to get better at that and so the first couple I just sort of played from like 4 to 6 p.m. at mm -hmm. that coffee shop when no one was there Okay. and that seemed okay but no one was there no one really it didn't and it just didn't seem like that was going to be a, a, a thing that made sense or was sustainable. Yeah. So then, um, I, then the next idea I had was like, oh, maybe let's, like, if I had someone come and play with me, like on fiddle, mm -hmm. a, then I don't have to take a bunch of breaks because then I can get the fiddle player to do that. Yeah. And B, it might be like a little more of like a, a thing worth seeing. Yeah. So some really uh, generous people did that the first couple times with me, like Melody Berger mm -hmm. and uh, and Libby. Um, and so, uh, that was kind of cool. And then I was like, oh, well, you know, they might not want to just play with me. Maybe 
they would like to do their own set. Mm -hmm. And then, so that's how I got the idea that the other person could do a solo set. And plus, I wanted to see what they would do. Yeah. At, because then I could learn from learn. that. Okay. And then, and then also I was like, and you know what? People probably, it'd be fun to have a jam too, especially if I have this guest here. People want to jam with the guest, just like I want to jam with the guest. Yeah. And then, so then that kind of came together and I just been doing that ever since and, and people seem to like it and it, like enough yeah. people, in, enough people come that it's like, it's it's worth doing yeah and so we've just been doing it for almost every week since then for like a, a couple of years yeah well i appreciate it i mean it's the only jam i know of in new york city that's not in a bar yeah so i appreciate it <laughs> uh, i'm really glad uh it's it's been great to have you 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 play all the time it's it's a so yeah well i think it's a lot of fun you've yeah. gotten some really incredible guests I know it's it's amazing. I'm yeah. I'm I'm thrilled. It, the The whole thing that makes it cool is is all those guests who are sort of down to do it, uh, m mostly just for the fun of it and for the yeah. challenge of playing solo and and also I think you know like the community aspect of bluegrass is so important and uh, and they're down to do it from that perspective too. Like they're, you know, there's pretty much no one who's too good to just like do a couple songs yeah. with with the uh, the regular people. Yeah. And so that's really cool, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, if it wasn't for your jam, I probably would not be playing. Oh, that's cool. So. That's nice to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. And most of these interviews wouldn't have happened, for sure. Oh, yeah. I met them all through oh, that cool. song. Like, except for, like, Sheriff, but, like, the first bunch of interviews I've met all through. Yeah. Sad Song Happy Hour. Cool. So, thank you. Oh, that's great. You, you've provided people with this project. <laughs> Yeah, and that's so that I guess that's the answer to your question about the influence of the community on the music and stuff, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you made a CD a while ago. Oh yeah. And all the songs that you have on there are the songs you sing at that song. Mm hmm So, how did you um write your CD? Like, how did you? Oh yeah. Well, your songs are pretty funny. Oh. I enjoyed them. Thanks. Um. Well, I started writing songs because, uh, just you know, like just like anybody starts writing songs, you're like, oh, maybe I'll try writing a song, and then you, okay, well, maybe I'll try writing another song, and you sort of just do that. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them I was sort of writing with the idea that um, they could work in uh, the tumble or maybe one of the other groups I was in or or something. I wasn't really sure, but then I realized that those weren't necessarily the best context for some of those songs, mm -mm. and then. After a while, I'd written enough songs that I was like, well, I should do something with these songs. Oh, and also I was in um, uh, with a, a couple friends of mine. Uh, we, we started like a uh, like kind of like a rock band or like a pop punk band. Okay. And this is this is around the same time I got into Michael Dave. So those were like two things. And the punk the punk side of me sort of withered and died as I got more into bluegrass. Okay. Um, not, not really, but um, <laughs> that that band sort of ran its course. But um, uh, what's the point? Oh, so some of the songs I had kind of for that context, mm -hmm. or I was trying to figure out where to where to use them, and then, and then I don't know. After at a certain point, I was like, I have all these songs, and I sort of set the personal challenge to myself that I wanted to be able to play them, uh, just by myself mm -hmm. at like Pete's candy store or something. Okay. And so this one New Year's, this is like maybe two or three years ago, I decided, okay, my New Year's resolution is I'm gonna set up a gig at Pete's candy store. Okay. And so. I like to stay inside on uh, New Year's Eve mm -hmm. and avoid the crowds. And also, my birthday's on January first, so it's like a yeah. very big, uh, it's a uh, very big night. Big, yeah, kind of big night. But I like to use it for like goal setting and personal reflection and stuff. It's just like <laughs> kind of lame and hilarious, but also I like it, it, it. Like it feels good to me to do that. Sure. And so that that January thir or uh, December thirty first, I emailed Pete's Candy Store. I like I had the the week prior to that I had off from work. I I had been like working on little iPhone demos of my songs and then I put them on SoundCloud and I kind of called them an EP. Okay. So it like seemed like I had done something. Yeah. And then I emailed Pete's Candy Store and I, I um, knew the booker Jake from, I just met him somewhere out in, at, a, at one of his gigs or something. And and uh, before midnight on New Year's Eve, he had already written me back and like sent oh. me a date. And so... I was like, wow, well, this New Year's resolution is off to a great start. Yeah. And so, so I played that gig, uh, you know, um, several weeks later. Uh, and that's, that's the one that was, 
so like I was just so nervous mm-hmm. and could also kind of barely just accompany myself and so I what was the question again <laughs> oh the album um, oh yeah so then once I started doing that I, I knew that once I um, got more practice doing that I would want to record the album so first mm-hmm. step was like kind of work those songs and then get better at them and then record an album of them and then once I had the album recorded then I kind of wanted to play them more so people would know about them so they might go on Spotify and check out the album or whatever mm-hmm. um, and so that's kind of how it worked out and um, I, another awesome opportunity in the, in the past couple of years that just just has been such a, like a, a an amazing thing has been on Wednesday nights I play in Jersey City with a great bluegrass band mm-hmm. with Sean Kiley yeah and um, at the Archer yeah and Bobby Hawk um, and then we usually have a fourth person like on banjo or uh, sometimes mandolin mm-hmm. and, who rotates and we just get different people and um, so I grabbed uh, Rob aka Bobby Hawk and uh, so he played duo with me on the album and yeah. again kind of that way I didn't have to take as many solos he could take all the little solos yeah. and, and fill things out and so that was wonderful to have him and, and you know until then I, I wouldn't have even dreamed that I could get someone of, of that level to play with me on my little songs yeah but just knowing him from the archer he was down to do it and uh he brought so much to it so it was, it was yeah that you know once the pieces kind of fall into place then you're like oh i'm ready to do this and then you just kind of do it so why did you decide to have like a duo like with just guitar and fiddle yeah i just wanted to make it as like straightforward as possible mm-hmm. and then i knew like once if you had like a whole band with like drums and bass it was just going to get more complicated more expensive more choices to make so if i could have done it completely solo i probably would have done that but then it's also nice just to have a little bit of give and take and also i love uh like you know there's like the five piece classic bluegrass group mm-hmm. i kind of in, in also in jazz too when i was in the jazz i always like 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 a, a trio versus a big band i always like trio better because there's sort of more space for different things to happen mm-hmm. there's just more space in general which i think like hits my ear better yeah um and so the same sort of like a, like you know 10 out of 10 level of sonics and filled up space and almost like a little bit of musical chaos that's in a big band or a five piece bluegrass band like a smaller band like a duo or a trio i always like better um like uh well not always but you know what i mean i have a, like a, i've noticed a preference for that like eli west and kahalen morrison have some duo yeah. records and i just love it because there's so much room for the interplay and you can hear each instrument really clearly and each instrument has just that much more of an impact and there's also a little less um uh what do you call it like um uh prescribed roles for the instruments where in a five piece bluegrass band at this point we all agree what the instruments are going to do but in a duo of like guitar and mandolin there's there's definitely some prescription there but um there's more room for like different things to happen Mm -hmm. so yeah, so I, I hoped it would be like that, but I'm not on the level where I could interact with Rob Hecht the way Eli yeah. and Kahalen do, but, uh, you know, uh, with my guitar playing, but still has a little of that, that vibe. Nice. Well, thank you for talking to me today. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Emma. So we got- I should sing or if I 
if you won't talk to us, why'd you put us here in the first place? I close the book and I rest my case. Cause she's 200,000 miles in outer space. It's dark down in